right. Uh, so welcome everyone and thank you for coming tonight to our first uh, of many events this year by the series Democracy in Peril. We are a series that brings speakers to campus virtually since the coronavirus pandemic has begun. Um, and all of our speakers use their expertise to shed light on contemporary political, cultural, and socioeconomic issues with a focus on present day developments that threaten the democratic values of our public or the idea of democracy more generally. I'm also gonna briefly announce our next speaker that is tentatively scheduled for October 19th. We're very excited to anticipate the visit of public historian, Christy Coleman, who is the executive director of the Jamestown Yorktown Foundation in Williamsburg, Virginia. Before that, she was CEO for 12 years of the American Civil War Museum in Richmond. Her talk will address the challenges of doing public history in an age of culture wars. So I'm now going to turn, well, I, I might just tell you a little bit about the, um, the evening. We're going to, I'm going to introduce Dr. Hanifi, our speaker, shortly, and Dr. Hanifi will give a talk, it, and then at the end of the talk, we're going to be able to have the opportunity to um, have some questions, and Dr. Hanifi will address the questions. Throughout the talk, if you have a question, if you could type it up and put it in the chat, we'll be reading the questions at the end of the evening. It is also, many of us are first time doing this on Zoom, so hopefully it will all go smoothly. Um, fingers crossed for that. So, all right. I would like to now turn to an introduction of my colleague, Dr. Shah Mahmoud Hanifi, who works here at JMU in the History Department and teaches course on the Middle East and South Asia. Dr. Hanifi's research and publications have addressed subjects including colonial political economy, the history of printing, the Pashto language, photography, cartography, animal envi and environmental studies, and orientalism in Afghanistan. His recent edited book focuses on the early 19th century British Indian scholar administrator, Mount Stuart Elphinstone, and he is now working on a monograph that examines the environmental history of Afghanistan through water, wood, animals, and food. Dr. Hanifi additionally serves on the editorial board of the journal Afghanistan and is a special theme editor on Afghanistan for the Oxford Research Encyclopedia of Asian History. In addition, he has also served on boards, um, including the American Historical Association, and he has received research grants from the Social Science Research Council, the Council of American Overseas Research Centers, the Asian Development Bank, and the Carnegie Corporation of New York. Before turning the floor, so to speak, over to Dr. Hanifi, I also just want to mention, I am a Latin Americanist, and so it is hard for us, for me to, talk about September 11th without mentioning another moment of September 11th in my part of the world. Um, so this talk to me that Dr. Hanifi will present tonight is something that resonates, the theme of US imperialism and democracy. Um, so I'm very interested in the connection between US democracy and imperialism. And what I'm referring to is the fact that the date of September 11th, which is resonates in US history and Afghanistan history, also re resonates in Latin American history. Um, and so every September 11th, I'm reminded of the complexity of imperialism and democracy, because I also think about September 11th, 1973, which was a date when the United States exercised its military and economic power to help overthrow a democratically elected president of Chile, known as Salvador Allende, and the US backed to install and then subsidize a violent military government of Augusto Pinochet. The legacy of this other September 11th is particularly relevant to Chile today, as that nation is in the process of rewriting its constitution, the last one, which was um, written in 1980 under the military dictatorship. It's now being drafted under the leadership of a Mapuche woman to integrate voices into the Chilean constitution, which have historically been overlooked. 
So I'm really excited to have Dr. Hanifi uh, speak about the complicated relationship between democracy and empire. Um, and so I will turn the floor over to Dr. Hanifi, who will talk to us about democracy, education, and imperialism in the United States and Afghanistan since 2001. Thank you. Right. Are you, can we hear you? Are you able to hear me? Yes. Okay, well, thank you very much, Kristen and the whole DIP uh, committee for organizing this. I'm certainly grateful to be here, but it's a really uh, not necessarily a happy subject. So um, I'd like to share my screen if that's possible. Can I try to do that? And are you able to see the screen? Okay. Um, what I'm trying to do here is to just help us think through the complex relationships between three complex issues of imperialism, democracy, and education. And um, to do this, I should forewarn you that I will be using a lot of images. I'll sort of uh, utilize an image is worth a thousand words and try to get a couple hundred thousand words in front of you or something like that. So it'll be very image heavy um, once we get going. And indeed, some of those images will be quite difficult to wrestle with. I wanna warn the audience now that some of the images um, that I will display address very difficult issues such as torture. And uh, you know, I've got photographs that speak to that. And um, I wanna, just make it known that this is, you know, a, a, an adult audience and uh, part of our, our challenge here is to wrestle with difficult images and think through them. Um, so in, in a fundamental way, I just want to ask you to think about how these concepts are related. Are they integrated? Do they collaborate evenly? Is there a hierarchy here in terms of priority or causation? How do we measure these relationships quantitatively, qualitatively? Um, one thing we know um, is that knowledge is not neutral. It comes from places with vested interests, institutions, structures, funding, foreign policy. And really um, what I'm trying to get us to think about are some of the uh, complexities of knowledge production, um, both abroad and, and at home in the context of Afghanistan since 2001. I've tried to outline in general the route that will travel really visually uh, on the left here. I'm gonna try to find a, uh, uh, a pointer, a, a, a laser pointer. I don't know if you can see my laser pointer, but what I'll try to do is to briefly treat each of these complex issues with a lot of images. Hopefully um, we'll have time to discuss anything that is sped through or overlooked in the question and answer. Our intention is also uh, to record this session. I wanna post it for your um, information. If you wanna go back and sort of look at something that I said very quickly, or contact me, please do, okay? So, um, I've tried to move, um, okay. Well, we are at James Madison University and we often see quotes from our founding father, James Madison. Often it seems to involve the political factions uh, quote. At least that's what I was exposed to. Here, I'd like you to take a look at one of his quotes from 1795, which speaks to the, um, really the, the issues of, of war and executive power over war. There's a wonderful quote there about seducing the mind. And I'd like to kind of um, pick up on what James Madison offered for us to think about um, in 1795 and look at the maps that are here of US military bases abroad. And there are so many of them, we actually don't know all of them and where they are. We're not privy to some of the covert operations that these bases involve. 
the lily pads in Africa are often hard to map. And so we have a lot of different ways to measure these numbers. Um, some people have added up, at least um, during the heyday of the uh, war in Afghanistan, over 800 bases around the world. And um, this involves extensive expenditures of revenue, tax dollars, and really the fundamental problem is um, a lot of the covert operations that sort of characterize the post-2001 global war on terror are unknown to the citizens who pay for them because of securitization of data. And that's a major issue, a democratic issue for us to wrestle with. Um, but I will try to further move my screen. And again, a very dense visual chart, the growth of intelligence agencies after 2001, 16 new intelligence or integrated intelligence agencies, old offices and agencies develop an, an, an intelligence wing. And in fact, uh, new intelligence agencies out of whole cloth are created. And this involves um, a great deal of intelligence specific funding as well as the global arms trade that the United States is um, heavily invested in for diplomatic and for um, you know, corporate reasons. And so um, this again, all these are just called from the web. There's really nothing um, specific here, but I, I'd like us to think about the proportionality of our budget that's spent on the military compared um, in this central screen to other countries in the world and um, kind of use this as a foundation for some further considerations. Now, again, a very busy screen. On the right, we have an example of the extensive economic impact of a single weapon system, the F-35 fighter, that affects a number of local and regional economies that generates a tremendous amount of revenue that is then fed back into the political system through campaign contributions. And um, this is connected to the growth in executive privilege after 9-11 for um, sort of defensive uh, warfare, which involves a lot of um, use of covert technologies and special operations and um, things that are hard to document. On the left here, we have reference to the kind of civil liberties questions um, about data harvesting and collection that um, uh, are in the news periodically. But um, the, the surveillance state and the national security state um, kind of structure are things that we need to think about when it comes to democracy. Interestingly, um, from what I can tell, on the 6th of January, the insurrectionists who were arrested, about 15% of them were military veterans. Now, how to break that down from Iraq to Afghanistan is beyond my capacity, but it's a similar figure to the number of um, veterans in Congress, which is closer to 20%, according to what I saw on the web. But in both the insurrectionists and the members of Congress, we have about a 15 to 20% uh, representative ratio. I find that interesting and worth pondering in a quantitative sense. Democracy is about the rule of law fundamentally. And the war in Afghanistan has involved considerable work on the rule of law. The rule of law has been kind of um, uh, activated in a number of college campuses, particularly Stanford and NYU, a number of private organizations and international organizations, a number of graduate theses, a number of think tank reports have focused on the rule of law. And um, we need to think about the context of imposing a rule of law um, in a occupation and warfare environment. Um, this is difficult. And I apologize for those that have um, difficulty thinking and digesting these images. But the war in Afghanistan was 
uh, began in 2001. The war in Iraq began in 2003. And there's much more data on Iraq than Afghanistan when it comes to um, all kinds of data. What has come out of Iraq is evidence, photographic evidence of a systematic regime of torture that involves the images at the top of the screen. And these are very difficult, um, but they come from somewhere. And eventually in this talk, we'll find out a little bit about where these um, sort of techniques come from. Um, what's important about the Iraq war is that it is by um, most measurements founded on a very serious big lie about nuclear weapons in Iraq. And we need to keep that in mind, that the foundation of the, what we see um, in Abu Ghraib is founded upon a lie. The war in Afghanistan also initiated a regime of detentions and black site renditions that have um, really a lot of paralegal implications. And there's been a significant effort um, by the US government to kind of legalize and legitimize uh, these activities um, through the courts and international courts. Um, the UN did not sanction the United States global war on terror. The war in Afghanistan and Iraq has generated a lot of um, uh, civilian uh, human rights violations by all warring parties, not just the United States, um, but the International Criminal Court has basically indicted the United States on war crimes just last year. The United States does not recognize the International Court. But these, um, the activities associated with the global war on terror um, challenge uh, legal precedents and push the legal boundaries, um, which involves a great deal of intellectual activity and a great deal of political activity. Um, in a democracy, how do we get information about what is happening with our foreign policy, particularly in the war on terror, in this case with Afghanistan and Iraq? And most recently, down in the corner here, are two books by journalists. They came out within the last month, and they speak to a sort of constant, perpetual series of public officials lying about the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, knowing that their statements are predicated on um, fantasies or delusions or outright lies. But prior to that, we've had a lot of um, sort of, um, whistleblower activity about the crimes that Abu Ghraib represent and the International Criminal Court have sanctioned the United States for. This involves the figure of formerly Bradley, now Chelsea Manning, who released a lot of Iraq and Afghanistan um, kind of illegal warfare activity by both US troops and contractors. The outsourcing of the war to contractors is a further legal sort of uh, uh, room for, uh, shall I say, gerrymandering in some, in some way. Um, but that release of information went to WikiLeaks. And WikiLeaks, of course, was won by Julian Assange. And the, the relationship between whistleblowers and how they actually blow their whistle um, is not always involving WikiLeaks. Edward Snowden, more recently, um, uh, was a whistleblower about the very kinds of surveillance issues that I just mentioned in a previous slide. Edward Snowden was concerned about the kind of um, civil rights intrusions that uh, telecommunications companies are exerting over the citizenry globally, particularly it was European telecommunications companies in his case. Um, we need to turn now to education. Um, having just looked at some of the parameters of democracy and democracy in the context of imperialism. And in the upper left, we have a recent uh, Secretary of Education. And we have to think of education now uh, historically in the United States through a series of um, federal acts, um, such as the Elementary and Secondary Education Act from 1965. No Child Left Behind in 2001, and in 2015, uh, ESS, Every Student Succeeds, or something like that. 
there's a history of um, kind of textbook politics, <coughs> excuse me, that are relevant to our overall concerns here. There are um, a number of questions, particularly about the, the funding streams, federal funding streams to particular disciplines and histories um, is very important here. As STEM has grown in budgetary girth at the expense of the humanities, including history. And uh, there's some very contentious battles over history that have uh, entered the public sphere recently. The 1619 project, uh, then kind of counteracted by President Trump's 1776 project. And Betsy DeVos figures into the history of education through the privatization. School choice is the kind of rhetoric here. But it's again, outsourcing um, a, a, a governmental sort of obligation to repay its citizens with strong education. Um, and that the kind of, this leads to sort of private universities and indeed Trump University the sort of scam that that was figures into our discussion here. Ed education also is relevant in terms of foreign policy, the development of schools abroad, particularly during the Cold War, particularly during the, um, particularly in the Middle East is really relevant here. And the role of the American University of Cairo, the American University of Beirut are really complex. There's a lot of, shall we say, over the table academic uh, activity, but a lot of covert CIA funding involved in some of the research at both of these universities, very complex relationships. Domestically during the Cold War, the National Defense Education Act led to a series of um, uh, funding streams for area studies programs, including the Middle East, but not limited not just the Middle East. And these are called Title VI programs with universities getting a lot of funding streams to study languages, critical languages, and other disciplines relevant to, again, a kind of foreign policy relationship um, to our educational system, both at a sort of all encompassing national education system and particularly at the university curricular level. Afghanistan was deeply impacted by these activities during the Cold War, particularly as development became also a tool for foreign policy, beginning with President Trump's Point Four program in uh, the late 1940s, which led to Afghanistan be being the recipient of extensive United States funding for irrigation projects in and around Southern Afghanistan, in and around Kandahar and the Helmand River ba Basin that are sites of the Taliban are sort of associated with the capital city of Kandahar. And the Helmand Valley is now a, an opium producing center of the world. This, this American irrigation development project failed. We see a similarity here between the Kandahar Airport and Dulles Airport. And indeed the same architect designed it. The Kandahar Airport becomes very important for the war on terror. It was the busiest airport in the world by flights uh, taking off, manned and unmanned. I'm including drone flights here for Kandahar. So um, the United States has a deep formal history in Afghanistan through development as well as educational exchange. My father came to this country in 1956 on an Afghan government scholarship tied to all of this development activity. Ashraf Ghani, the president of, uh, former president of Afghanistan just recently uh, exited, was an American high school student in Seattle. And this does matter. It does matter, um, the educational history. It does matter. Um, some of the military activity. And again, uh, the military is, uh, you know, a, a kinetic engine, but it also is an intellectual engine and a bureaucratic engine and an economic engine. And um, we need to reckon with a couple of issues here. First of all, uh, General Mattis, um, who is, is a figure of, of current kind of political renown. And he is very important for a phrase about how, what a hoot it is to shoot Afghan men because they slap women around for five years. 
and quotes like this that are uh, kind of highly gendered and highly militarized. Petraeus on the right, General Petraeus is associated with the counterinsurgency field manual and sort of a smart war. If, if Mattis represents the sort of brute warfare, Petraeus represents the intellectual warrior. And these are government um, actors, military, official military factors, but we also have corporate actors, Eric Prince of Blackwater, um, a, a, a security firm is also very active. And recently he, uh, it's alleged that he was charging multiple millions of dollars to evacuate um, Afghans during the Kabul airport siege. And so we need to keep the profiteering uh, here uh, in mind. The United States military under Obama, President Obama initiated a kind of uh, neo-colonial category of AFPAC and a funding stream for studying the Pashto language, the Defense Language Institute, and a whole series of people trained, about a thousand people trained as AFPAC hands officially in the military. Very, very significant um, educational component here. There are a number of other governmental funding streams that speak to warfare and foreign policy and eventually sort of a number of not military but government institutions, not government institutions but private organizations. And indeed, um, we will eventually be able just sort of going quickly, there's a number of programs, the Pat Roberts Intelligence Program started in the 90s, but got a big windfall of activity after 2001. The leader LDESP was generated in 2001 to sort of give military commanders, junior and senior officers, commanding officers, some cultural training. And there are JMU professors that were involved with that. The Minerva Research Institute, you can see, is kind of bringing science and uh, foreign policy and warfare together through a lot of funding grants. The American Institute of Indi Afghanistan Studies is also another example of the sort of private um, non-governmental institutions, uh, 501Cs, uh, that are involved here. And the United States Institutes of Peace is another one. The Marine Corps University, got its own building after 2001. It really exploded uh, intellectually with a lot of programming on the Middle East and Iran, for example, that continue today. So the relationship. Now, um, we have two disciplines that have a particularly uh, ro active role here in the war on terror. The first is anthropology. And the counterinsurgency field manual, as I mentioned, is connected to the human terrain system, which was a US military program between 2007 and 14, that um, is essentially the structure for counterinsurgency and nation building, where social scientists, anthropologists in particular, were embedded with military um, troops around provincial reconstruction teams in Afghanistan. And this was rejected by the American Anthropological Association as a violation of its disciplinary ethics, a kind of academic Hipp Hippocratic oath of doing no harm first. The American Psychological Association uh, received a stain on its reputation for its intimate involvement in the torture regimes. The waterboarding that we saw beginning um, uh, really with uh, earlier examples of US imperial activity in the Philippines, we'll talk about in a moment, but um, sort of sleep deprivation, all kinds of the, 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 the psychology of using canine dogs on Muslims has a intellectual or a sort of militarized intellectual basis. And we need to take that very seriously. We need to take the number of anthropologists of Afghanistan who have been wrapped into um, kind of military anthropology, um, problematically so from disciplinary ethics perspectives. JMU has been dramatically affected by 9-11. And I can speak because I got here 
in 2003 and have watched a number of programs develop. I was brought here as a creature of the 9-11 interest in Afghanistan. I'm sure it was not me, but more the subject of Afghanistan that got me hired here. And we can debate all that kind of stuff later. But the point is, is there was a market for certain kinds of knowledge about certain kinds of places. And JMUs, there's been a, a very robust growth of programs after 9-11, particularly, I would say most prominently, the intelligence analysis program that is celebrated in many ways here. I have a number of intelligence analysis to excellent students, but it's the politics that and, and the funding streams that we need to start thinking about um, when it comes to this program and other programs. The X-Lab work on drones. It has a, um, a number of connections to the kinds of warfare that are legally problematic. We have the marketing of Afghanistan through CIA officers and CIA officers in the classroom is um, something that a lot of my colleagues at other universities find it abhorrent, frankly. And they're shocked when I go to other places or even other parts of the world and describe this program that we have here, not for its personalities, and this has nothing to do with personalities, but its priorities and its structure and its funding streams. And of course, uh, justice studies emerged out of political science, as I recall, I can be corrected. The uh, Center for International Stabilization and Recovery, kind of demining de is what it's known as, existed before 9-11, surged after 9-11. JMU students have been to Afghanistan for demining purposes. Please note that the United States is not a signatory to the uh, Cluster Munitions Convention. The United States is um, unique in that regard. So um, there are a number of issues here locally, and I can imagine uh, an interest in discussing them perhaps in the question and answer. Moving to imperialism. It is quite contentious to frame the United States as an empire. This is not always something that um, uh, is agreed upon. But those who do see the United States as an empire often look to the Spanish-American War to begin that imperial history. And we see in the upper left a, a very, um, again, kind of difficult image in terms of, it, of, it, of its racist kind of um, predicates here. But what's important about the Spanish-American War is waterboarding. The question of waterboarding that we just saw recently is also quite a contested issue over a hundred years ago in the Spanish-American War. And the impact of war in the Philippines, even after independence, the, the American basis of Clark and Subic Bay, tremendously, tremendously significant for Philippines. Now, um, there are two things I would like to do to explain the rest of this slide. The United States, after will jump from the Spanish-American War to the post-World War II era, the Cold War era. And after World War II, the United States got involved heavily around the world in a number of covert operations. The most renowned of them, that is a CIA coup in Iran in 1953, um, is not unique. If we look at the history of US covert interventions and political destabilization around the world. We have a number of countries in the range of 30, some of whom are destabilized more than once by covert means. And um, the United States coup, the United States led coup in Iran, brought the Shah of Iran to power, and the United States began transferring nuclear technology to the Shah of Iran. The United States, along with Mossad and Israel, began uh, training the intelligence services of Iran that were just re replete with human rights violations against the citizens of Iran. That in fact, many people argue, led to the popular support for the Iranian uh, Islamic revolution in 1979, led by Khomeini here. 
Um, I have the rest of these slides for the School of the Americas to kind of capture what Dr. McCleary was referencing with um, Latin America and its exposure to United States imperialism. The anchor for that reference and connection is the School of the Americas, which began after World War II in Panama and then shifted to Fort Benning in Georgia, I believe, where a number of what we think of as dictators and paramilitary leaders and junta leaders in El Salvador, uh, in Nicaragua, uh, we see Panama. Actually, actually, it's the training of Argentine uh, paramilitary that uh, sort of unleashed a, a reign of terror on the Argentine population with, I mean, really abduction, rape, torture, throwing people out of airplanes that led to the, the, the protests of the women. I forget, Dr. McCleary will tell us about the weekly protests of, 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 of mothers of the disappeared in Buenos Aires. And um, this is, uh, the, it's the Argentine military that trained the uh, Nicaraguan Contras in the 1980s. And so there's a number of connections to the School of Americas, including Vietnamese allies during the Vietnam War. And that's where we start to see counterinsurgency that got a sort of rejuvenated life after 9-11. But the counterinsurgency um, kind of manuals and trainings in um, sort of the, the, the ugly acts of war, um, there's a lineage here. There are institutions and resources here that we need to tap into. For Afghanistan, the covert funding of the Afghan Mujahideen in the 1980s um, is very, very significant. In the Cold War period, Afghanistan represents the intimate collusion between the academy and intelligence services. That is the CIA and the universities of the United States. And the figure here shown is Louis Dupree, who has been referred to as the Dean of Afghanistan Studies, who um, was a uh, intellectual founding father for the Mujahideen. And this is an anthropologist in sort of battle, uh, uh, sort of uh, portrait here with Afghan Mujahideen, very complex individual. The thing that Dupree did most significantly is develop the idea of ethnicity and the ethnic map of Afghanistan that was instrumentalized. We can see immediately uh, after 9-11, ethnicity became the tool to understand Afghanistan. Ethnicity became the thing to manipulate in the conduct of war in Afghanistan. And that itself uh, opens up a lot of complex issues perhaps for later discussion. These are images of the Mujahideen the Afghan Mujahideen in the White House with Ronald Reagan. And it is these people, the Mujahideen, who are the Taliban. The Taliban call themselves the Mujahideen. A number of these figures are in the Taliban. The United States covert support of the Mujahideen birthed the group that we now sort of see as the Taliban. This is significant. It can't be forgotten. And it is significant that this destabilization of Afghanistan created the world's largest refugee problem, 6 million people, and still refugees flee, I mean, just, just flowing out of Afghanistan. It's such a complex issue. The people involved in the Mujahideen are um, notorious for their human rights violations upon the Afghan people. I don't even, the, the verbal descriptions of what I could uh, share are, 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 are as horrific as the Abu Ghraib photos. And I, I um, the Taliban, excuse me, here are the Taliban. This is the photo most recently of them at the desk Ashraf Ghani vacated a few moments ago. The point is to say the pictures you just saw are essentially a lineage descendant of, of these people, all connected to US covert operations. The thing called elections, which is a big part of democracy, has been a big sort of point of discussion in Afghanistan. 
The architecture, the engineering of elections, the politicization of elections, who can vote, where to vote, how to vote, that kind of election engineering in Afghanistan um, is, is an object lesson for other election engineerings. And um, we have to look at the two heads of state. The first, Hamid Karzai, who is a, a creature of the special operations, uh, the, the special ops force that basically brought him into Afghanistan in the context of the, of the war in the fall of 2001. And then an election in 2004, an election in 2009, Ghani's elected in 2014. Again, strange electoral um, uh, uh, process and results with sort of a split presidency. Abdullah Abdullah becomes a secondary president. Hamid Karzai was a spokesman for the Mujahideen, indeed testified before Congress uh, as a Mujahideen spokesman. Ashraf Ghani was an academic was indeed a Marxist anthropologist who apparently, it's unclear, but left academia at Johns Hopkins for the World Bank. Some people suspect it was a tenure issue, didn't get tenure, went to work for the World Bank. So be, be, he became like Afghanistan does, there's a sort of professional conversion. Um, Ashraf Ghani became a very high profile financial advisor to Karzai, and ultimately head of state. While he was with the World Bank, he wrote a book, very famous, Fixing Failed States. There's a TED talk of Fixing Failed States, Ashraf Ghani, an intellectual. And his theory here is that the ordinary people out there in the world really can bypass national governments if they can connect right directly to the international humanitarian organizations. And of course, um, organizations like the World Bank will mediate that. Um, the war in Afghanistan has been an air war. The war in Afghanistan since 2001 has been relentless bombing. The number of bombs is unknown. Documented, they say 46,000 bombs dropped since 2001, but that's public records. Covert bombing, we don't know. The drone bombing, we don't know. We have limited information about this. It's been incessant. And the kinds of technologies, the kind of funding streams, the kind of corporations that have profited from this is just astounding. And um, here is the F-35 fighter that we mentioned flying over Afghanistan. Um, we see drones and it's really the drone war that generates that sort of terrorism effect for the citizens of Afghanistan, Pakistan, Yemen, and wherever drones are used. Just a devastating experience to have a drone hovering and then incinerate bodies uh, to the point they can't be identified. When you can't find a body to bury, a social sort of memory of, of loss and grieving is difficult. Blimps, for a number of years, there were blimps all over Kabul, all over Eastern Afghanistan, Connect, connecting data. Where did that data go? How do we get that data? I, as an environmental historian, would like all the satellite imagery of the forests of Afghanistan, but it's closed because it's securitized. And this is the question, where does all this data go? How do we get the war data? And Afghanistan has been a black hole, a silence. There was five minutes of, of corporate news on Afghanistan in 2020 by all three networks, five minutes total, three major networks, 2020, last year. There have been war crimes, crimes against humanity galore in Afghanistan beginning with the massacre of Taliban prisoners by a US warlord ally. Thousands of individuals in tractor trailer trucks pum pummeled or whatever machine guns do to a tractor trailer and then buried. And then when the word got out that the international community knows, then trying to steal the bones and remove the evidence, dash di leili, war crime. That's, that's, that's the fall of 2001. Skipping to the evacuation just a couple of weeks ago, the United States drone bombed what was alleged to have been two terrorists in action about to um, detonate themselves again upon uh, Marines and civilians at the gates of the Kabul airport. Well, 
That's the first uh, word. That's not what happened. Local journalists, international journalists now know that that's 10 innocent victims. No, no would be terrorist. It was an aid worker from an NGO from Pasadena, California and his family, Zarmali Ahmadi and his family were killed in this drone bombing. And the night vision goggles here of the last soldier leaving Afghanistan are reminiscent of the night raids, the special operations night raids that lead to the assassinations, abductions, renditions of innocent people to torture chambers in places like Bagram Air Base. The United States also involved itself in nation building and a lot of economic activity in Afghanistan with, for example, irrigation. And the problem with development projects such as irrigation canals, and note please the irony of the 1950s, 60s and 70s United States irrigation efforts and the current irrigation efforts. Once you establish an industrial irrigation system, you need the expertise, the technology, the wherewithal to maintain them. And it's a very different labor regime and technological regime when you have cement dams as opposed to mud dams, for example. But the point is, all of this development activity is contextualized by warfare. It's, context it's instrumentalized to become a part of uh, warfare and counterinsurgency. So it's not just neutral development. It's politicized development in an imperial war context. And humanitarianism in war fields is something we need to think about. Up in the left here is Bagram, which is a crime site. Bagram Air Base um, is just renowned as, 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 a, as a house of horrors. Now, it, it, I want to just turn to the, when they say they have left Afghanistan, they've left behind a lot of pollution and junk. And the, the waste, the, the pollution, the forever chemicals, the toxins, the burn pits in Afghanistan, there were 200 burn pits burning everything from mattresses to medical waste, which means human uh, products, aluminum cans, the, uh, the plastic water bottles, the carcinogens in the air. It, it, devastating, devastating for the local economies. The pollution in Kabul from these two stroke military vehicles has rendered Kabul one of the most polluted cities in the world because of warfare. This is the slow violence of war, the slow environmental violence that the inhabitants, the people, the citizens of Afghanistan will be living with. In addition to the um, sort of the, the psychological damage, the post-traumatic stress from a relentless bombardment from the air. Um, these are also some difficult images, but the instrumentalization of education, particularly girls' schools, has been um, just a significant part of the American experience in Afghanistan. The war, the only time a presidential uh, address to the nation, a fireside chat, was given by a spouse was when Laura Bush spoke in 2001 about the plight of Afghan women. And uh, that has a, a pre-2001 history with the feminist majority. Um, but the point here is that the American University of Afghanistan became a celebrated, you know, sort of pillar of American beneficence educationally to Afghanistan. It also was attacked multiple times. In including 2016, when 13 students were, were killed. So what happens with education and with girls' schools is that they become a part of the battlefield when they're um, politicized. To, and the curriculum of the American University in Afghanistan is worth discussion. The curriculum for these uh, private girls' schools, and we have to remember, it's not just formal US um, governmental policies, but private corporations and donors, private individuals developing girls' schools, which became kind of a scam and a sham. Afghanistan was known as Afghani scam for corporate profiteers and others. The most famous girls' school sort of um, um, 
scandal is this author Mortensen with three cups of tea that was famous and then was turned out to be a fraud. Um, the, the amount of, of girls schools that have been the, attacked by suicide bombers, killing dozens of young school children at a time must be reckoned with. To put schools on the front line of a war must be reckoned with both physically and intellectually in Afghanistan and in the United States. The whole gender dimension of the war is it's complex. And the sort of um, use of sports, let's just take sports and cricket and judo and wrestling and the girls soccer team that was sort of uh, smuggled out of Afghanistan recently, not through government, but through private actors um, based in Texas, they're in Australia now but they were subject to systematic sexual abuse by the leaders of the Afghanistan Football Federation, been charged by UEFA. And the amount of what we could call sexual abuse, kind of Me Too moments in Afghanistan at Kabul University and other government bureaucracies and with the girls uh, uh, soccer team needs to be reckoned with. As, as a, as a um, you know, um, maybe minority or secondary reading, but fact that needs to be wrestled with along with the progress in terms of education and journalism and things like that. So we need to wrestle with the contradictions that imperialism throws our way. And that will conclude my presentation.